welcome everyone to another episode of 131 Not Out, a show showcasing pioneering Indians in New Zealand. And today my guest on the show is Ramesh Patel, a true icon in our community, uh, Olympic gold medalist in 1976, uh, a man that played 200 matches for Auckland and over 100 games for his country. So welcome Ramesh, welcome to the show. Thank you. Yeah, just want to... Be um, catch up and, and find out uh, a little bit about your journey. Um, but uh, what are you up to at the moment in semi-retirement? Well, <laughs> semi-retirement, so I'm at St. Kennigan College, just running a hockey program there. Um, I started out to do it for three years, uh, but it's been, that was 11 years ago. I'm still there and loving it. And you're a granddad. Uh, I'm a granddad, that's, uh, that's my other part-time job, <laughs> um, but that's the most pleasurable part. Yeah, yeah. six grandchildren. You know, um, the eldest is four. Um, yeah, just love spending time with them. So, uh, Ramesh, early days uh, for you were in Onihanga. Um, you know, um, obviously we are related through our, our grand, uh, your mum and, and my granddad, but um, you were, you know, a massive uh, aspirational figure for many of us. Um, you know, we, we loved seeing you and hanging out with you in Onihanga on the mall. Um, what can you recall about those early days like primary school and, and high school at Onihanga? Yeah, so living in Onihanga and uh, loved Onihanga. Um, and uh, we had a big property um, which uh, meant cricket and hockey all year round. It was you know, just wonderful days. And uh, in a family of five boys and two girls, you know, we had, we had uh, opposition as well. Um, and we had, of course, uh, a lot of friends around the place, um, uh, your uncles, etc., who would come around and play as well. And um, and then only hung up primary, first school, and while we had a hockey background, um, you know, my eldest, uh, my dad played a bit, but uh, my eldest brother played. Um, it wasn't until I went to only hung primary that uh, someone came along the school and said, is anyone interested in joining a club? Well, I put up my hand and uh, was there with the club ever since. Yeah, so that's how it all started, really. I remember um, the galley kitchen uh, at the house, and I'd never you know, seen that, and, and seven of the siblings all sitting there having their, their uh, dinner every day. Um, can you tell me a little bit about, um, because it was a bit of a shock to me to see you eating uh, uh, gorse or lamb. Rogan Josh every day. So can you tell me a little bit about, um, because a lot of Indian families were having that once once a week, but you guys were having it many days. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, uh, you know, a big family. Of course, uh, I can remember it was probably uh, rationing out some of the food and, you know, first in, sort of first, you know, you got a good meal and you, yeah. the rest got the leftovers. But no, always, um, you know, as parents always insisted that we all ate together. Um, which was um, something that was uh, pretty good. Um, while it was, uh, there was a little bit of traditional, you know, males might eat first um, and then um, uh, the, male, uh, the females afterwards. You know, that didn't quite exist in our, um, our home. You know, we're all down together, but uh, it certainly did exist with the cleaning up. <laughs> <laughs> the boys never had to clean up, so I've learned to do all of that now in my later years. And so Dad was working at Hallaby's... Yeah, so Dad um, started in the fruit shop and then um, sold the fruit shop to uh, my eldest brother um, and then um, found a job at uh, Hallaby's, which was uh, which was pretty good for us as well because we did all our holiday jobs out there at Varsity, so got to know the place a little bit and uh, loved it. In fact, my first uh, year holiday job that got there, it was uh, they had a strike. Well, I loved that. <laughs> And it was all about one man, one job. You know, they were complaining about um, asking some of the <laughs> workers to do two parts of a job. And so I remember being in that sort of in their locker rooms and with a broom and pounding the floor. One man, one job. Yeah, <laughs> it was great. Yeah. And I loved it. My dad didn't appreciate it too much, but yeah. So uh, Manukau Intermediate and then off to Onihanga High School? Yeah, so Manukau Intermediate, which is now called Royal Oak Intermediate, um, and then off to Onihanga High School, yeah. So uh, Intermediate as well. Uh, didn't want to leave Onihanga Primary, as you do, you get settled, but then the Intermediate School was uh, pretty good. They had a very good hockey, pro I mean, a cricket program, 
no hockey, yeah. um, but a very good cricket program, and uh, I really appreciated that. Um, uh, there was a guy, Mr Spencer, who took the um, cricket team there, and there's been a number of good cricketers that have come through there as well. Yeah. And you met my good friend uh, Rod Heath, was that at um, uh, Onyango High School? Yes, so he was a year ahead of me, and um, yeah, he was someone I looked up to in those uh, days, um, and then, of course, he went on to Onyango High as well. Um, and a uh, very good cricketer, and uh, so, yeah, spent a bit of time with him, and uh, and that's and I joined Cornwall Cricket Club as well okay. and played there for a little bit before I joined the Indian Sports Club. And um, I always sort of was fascinated at, at Cornwall because, um, you know, they, they told me I was going to be the first guy that played in their premier team, and I felt embarrassed because I knew you were a way better cricketer than I was, and you hadn't played there what, what was the was the journey that hockey got in the way at Cornwall yeah a little bit you know um pretty much uh, uh cricket um and hockey were on a parallel all okay. that way in terms of in choosing well didn't have to make a choice because it was pretty clear cut in those days that you know once the hockey fields uh were finished you know you had to free them up for cricket um but that was also uh pretty much for us about um you know give away your hockey stick and now we all get into cricket and, and you play cricket for a good you know, um, good season as well. Um, so that was pretty much how we um, you know, always played. So it was about once I got into the New Zealand squad or trials yes. and um, you know, I was 17 when I got into the first trials and then um, the following year someone had pulled out of the, uh, the squad and I got into the team as an 18-year-old, um, and that's how it all pretty much started, and therefore my choice was already made. You know, it was going to be hockey after that, but I always regretted not being able to play um, cricket as well. So yeah. um, that's why I sort of later thought uh, I'll, I'll play for Indian Sports yep. um, Club because cricket wasn't the path I had chosen at that stage, and then... After a couple of years, I wanted to play premier cricket, so I did join the Alice Lee Cricket Club That's for right. a couple of years to just to try my hand, but uh, I think the sport had passed me by by then. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ramesh, you went to uh, the St. Luke's Hockey Club um, and obviously also established a, a lifelong lasting friendship with Mohan Patel. Um, can you tell me about those, those early days at St. Luke's, uh, the nurturing and mentoring that you got and support? Because uh, I know there was a lot of that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so as I mentioned before, from Only Hunger Primary, someone from the St. Luke's Hockey Club had come along and asked us if we wanted to play. I think the enticing thing was a free hockey stick. Well, I was in for that. Yeah. And um, so that's how I joined. And then uh, uh, Mo Mohan, um, good friend, was, was also there. Um, David Appleby. Um, another good friend and still lifetime friends. I mean, just played golf the other day, you know, <laughs> so we've been friends ever since. Um, yeah, started at St. Luke's Hockey Club. Um, what I remember in particular is uh, our coach, Roy Trotman. Um, there was another manager, Merv Wattam. Um, these are all St. Luke's people um, that, you know, had a huge influence on our hockey careers. Um, David's mum, Tess, would uh, drive us to the ground, you know, okay. other, otherwise, you know, we'd either catch a bus or whatever because our parents were busy in the fruit shop, yep. you know, so we used to have to make our own way there. Um, but um, they were a huge influence and the, and the club was huge and um, it was part of the reason why I probably stayed there the whole time is just, you know, how well they looked after us. And as you know, um, you know, there was a time when I got a little bit of pressure from the Indian Sports Club um, to because they had just established themselves uh, as a sports club in terms of getting into premier level. Yes. Um, and there was a time when I was sort of um, pressured into playing with the Indian Sports Club, but the one thing that kept me um, with the St Luke's Hockey Club was just probably um, the influence they had on me at a younger age, um, how they supported me. Um, even small things like, and I think they probably gave me about a $50 voucher to go to the Hatch Cup tournament when I got selected for the right. Auckland team. But just um, little things like that, uh, you know, you think, well, you know, they looked after you. There's no way I'm going to move. Yeah. Um, and my way of sort of uh, 
getting around that was to join the Indian Sports Club in cricket. Yeah. <laughs> so I did get my uh, get a bit of both, really. Yeah. yeah. And so the Auckland Association, uh, you got involved, obviously picked in the Hatch Cup team at it, an 11, 12-year-old, and then you worked your way up, became the captain. You know, we won all those Challenge Shields as an association and over 200 matches. Um, clearly, there were some significant highlights in, in that part of, of your career. Yeah, look, uh, there's no doubt for me, um, playing for Auckland was uh, probably the highlight of my career. There's no doubt, you know, winning a gold medal probably surpasses that a little bit. And playing for the, the country was great, but um, there was a long, you know, I was playing for Auckland for 15 years, uh, or 16 maybe, and um, for New Zealand for 15 years. But there was a long period there where, again, the friendships and the success we had for Auckland just, you know, I just loved uh, being part of Auckland, um, we had a very good team. We sort of uh, overtook Canterbury, you know, who were the had, uh, used to win the Challenge Shield just year after year after year till we came along, and then this was the young guns, if you like, um, through the Auckland team, and then we started to dominate. Um, the style of hockey we were playing was something that is another reason why I liked and preferred playing for Auckland. Sometimes even over playing for the national team in some years, yeah. um, and purely because of the way we played um, and the satisfaction you got. Um, uh, playing for the national team, I, don't get me wrong, it was wonderful playing for the national team as well, but you know, sometimes you have your ups and downs and in terms of styles and you know, um, <laughs> yeah. coaches' preferences and things like that. But um, uh, certainly for Auckland, uh, it, was a, it was a wonderful period. Um, and still recall that as being some of my finest uh, hockey. And um, Mr Armstrong, Ivan Armstrong, oh, coach yeah. of Auckland, a character <laughs> obviously at the back of the studio here in Mungary, he was uh, the principal of Mungary College for many years. Yes, yes. What uh, was his influence? <laughs> a huge influence. Um, you know, we used to train at Auckland Grammar, and he always, uh, Ivan always used to joke at, uh, when we were at Auckland Grammar, and he says, yes, here we have eggs, and I'm at a school called SAGS. <laughs> and he used to just, uh, you know, always joke about, uh, you know, where he was teaching yeah. um, and where we were t uh, obviously playing. But huge influence again, more a uh, people management type person um, as opposed to a technical coach. Um, but again, huge influence um, and sort of remained friends all the way through. But someone we had a lot of respect for. And he was... He came from the West Coast initially and then went to Canterbury um, and played there. Um, he took the uh, New Zealand team to Mexico. Yes. Um, and uh, But uh, probably the players in the team, who was dominated by a lot of Canterbury players, probably didn't like his coaching and so they parted ways and he wasn't very well liked. Okay. Um, so he came across to Auckland. The coach of Canterbury was Cyril Walter. Um, Sora Walter and Ivan Armstrong didn't get on much. And yes. so, you know, he, he had the classic Auckland versus Canterbury matches, you know, because as players, you know, all we wanted to do was beat Canterbury. Yes. And, um, and then the coaches didn't get on either. And that so it made it a huge rivalry. Um, as it turned out, um, the Auckland and Canterbury players, while we wanted to beat each other, you know, we had a huge amount of respect for each other um, as players. Um, I don't think the coaches ever had a respect for each other. Yeah. But, um, yeah, huge rivalry um, all the way through. But Ivan was, uh, you know, a great and huge influence on uh, our hockey careers, not only mine, but a lot of the players of that time. He uh, he told a great story. So we invited him uh, when I coached Auckland to speak to the players, and um, he told the story of Cyril Walter and first beating Canterbury. Um, and he said, you know, Cyril Walter was this guy People called him a communist because he had a little communist yes. sort of shop in the middle of Canterbury in Christchurch. And um, the, the game was won uh, by Auckland. And so uh, Ivan decided to go and shake um, Cyril Walter's hand. And uh, Cyril had the pipe and didn't put his hand out to shake Ivan's hand. So Ivan said to him, uh, thanks, uh, thanks for the match, Cyril. And... Uh, and Cyril Walter turned to Ivan and said, um, he says, uh, Ivan, um, if I was coaching Auckland uh, today, we would have won 5-1. Mm. And and um, and Ivan turned around to uh, uh, Cyril and he said, uh, Cyril, 
if I was coaching Canterbury today, we wouldn't have lost. <laughs> no, that's right. That's, so yeah. he's a, he was a great man. Huh? Good stories. Yeah. Very good stories. Yeah. yeah. It's, um, yeah, that's, uh, uh, you know, I, I think that part of the success of the national team at that time um, was because of the rivalry of that provincial um, team, you know. So uh, we had mainly Aucklanders and Canterbury players in that uh, 76 team. team. Um, but it was that rivalry in that period of time, and, and also Wellington, who was sort of coming up to the third, but part of that rivalry, you know, just hardened us um, and uh, made us more resilient, tougher, more skillful, probably in the sense that, you know, we have to lift our game. Um, and that, I think, um, went into that uh, national team at that time. So uh, how old were you when you first played for the national side? Yeah, so I was 18. Uh, when I first played, and um, that was in 1972. So um, it's my uh, uh, just out of school, okay, and uh, first year at varsity. And then, um, as I mentioned before, I got into the squad because someone had pulled out. In fact, it was Ashley Corbett okay. who um, pulled out of that squad. He was in that squad, and he was uh, obviously would have, if he'd been there, he would have been in the team. Um, and he pulled out sort of three months before, so they invited me because they'd probably see me at a Colts tournament or something. Um, went along and got in okay. um, into the team, so that was a bit of a surprise. And so first Olympics in Munich in 1972, and off I went. So it was huge. Yeah. There. And had you played for Auckland by that stage? Uh, yes, I had. Yeah. So in 1971, I was sort of just in the, the team in my um, seventh form year. Okay. Um, but... Uh, I didn't play a lot. Okay. Um, I, I'm sure they would have seen me through the Colts because they wouldn't have seen me as much in that. In the Auckland 70, side. Yeah, in the yeah. Auckland side in 71. But 72 was, yeah, the national team. So Olympic Games, Munich, obviously it was a disrupted Olympic Games. Yeah. What were yeah, your memories uh, of, of 72? Yeah, obviously, you know, tarnished by um, um, the, uh, the Israeli uh, massacre in, at, in the village. Um, that was huge you know, by the Black September group. Um, we happened to be in the village or the uh, apartments right next door. So we were woken at about um, five o'clock in the morning um, and uh, told to move out of our apartments. We didn't really know what was going on, but we saw all the guards, etc. went to the cafeteria area and then we were told. And so... Um, you know, uh, we didn't know whether the games were going to go on or not. Uh, most of us sort of felt they shouldn't have gone on, you know, um, but uh, the Olympic Committee said, no, games will carry on. Um, so you get your head around that and you're back into it again. Um, so, yeah, it was quite uh, uh, quite an amazing Olympics because of that. Um, from my point of view as a young uh, player, you know, it was a real eye opener, you know. It was just, I remember all the things you probably tell all the players you don't do, you know. Yeah. When you go there, don't go starry eyed and, you know, eat all the food and <laughs> think of all the ice creams. Yeah. There was all free ice creams. No, this is exactly what we do. I yeah. can remember eating, you know, steaks and things, and, you know, as a Hindu, <laughs> yeah. as well, but <laughs> eating steaks, you know, on most days. Um, yeah. You know, we would, uh, on our days off, we would go off and have a beer. Yeah. You know, th in those days, those were the things we would we we were doing, yeah. you know. Um, at the same time, of course, you know, still serious about playing the hockey, and so um, it was a real thrill just to be involved, one, in the Olympic Village and being part of the Olympics, and then playing playing the games, which was yes. just amazing. It's uh, and came came back, um, you know, more, uh, you know, besides the the incident that happened there, you know, it was more about all those glossy things, you know. Yeah. And these days, of course, we all know that you know the one thing you get out of your head is, you know, all those things that all the surroundings around you, you know, yes. take. Keep that out of your focus, but in those days, that's what I remember. Yeah, <laughs> I was <laughs> so the beer halls, yeah. the music halls. Oh, yeah. absolutely! You yeah. know, all those things were were just part part yeah. of it, and I was just following what everyone else was doing. Yeah, I didn't know any better. Yeah, 
Mm. And were there athletes that you saw from other sports and went, wow, that's so-and-so? Absolutely. You yeah. hear the same stories now. You know, you go to the dining hall and you see the tall basketballers or the small gymnasts, gymnasts yep. you know, or the boxers. And, the, you know, and you say, wow, yeah, I've seen these people on TV. You yeah. know? So, yeah, you are. You're doing a little bit of that as well. Nice. And, um, yeah, so it's, it's wonderful. And so there was this clear motivation clearly after 72 for you to go, right, this is – this is uh, what I want to be doing, and yeah, 76 now comes along. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about the sort of innovations that New Zealand obviously had. We, you know, earlier we were talking about the boots and all these things, but how, how were we sort of ahead of the game in a sense before we even got there? Yeah, so, um, you know, obviously um, you were, were one of the uh, countries that was sort of took, it, took its time in getting artificial turf. There. And so one in 76, you have an artificial turf. In the lead up to that, um, you know, uh, quite a few of the players had been to Mexico in 68. Okay. You had a few uh, younger Aucklanders like ourselves um, in 72, uh, which probably didn't have the experience. Um, but then we're coming into 76 and suddenly, you know, we're moulding a team. This rivalry between Auckland and Canterbury was going on and now Auckland had taken over Canterbury. Um, but you still had the majority of the players in the team as Canterbury players. Um, so then it started to reflect in the national team. We started now to win a few games. We started in 73. We had a World Cup in Malaysia. We beat Holland, who were the previous World Cup champs. Um, uh, we played Holland in uh, 74. Uh, sorry, there was... Uh, we played Holland in 74 and beat them in a match. We were 3-0 down and beat them 4-3 in Christchurch. Um, and then in 75, we also beat them 1-0 in the World okay. Cup in uh, Malaysia. Um, and so we're starting to see signs of, you know, that, oh, look, we can compete now Indeed, with, yeah. the, with the others. And so we were probably going into the Olympics there ranked about 6th or 7th. Uh, we went to Toronto um, for the build-up, you know, because we hadn't experienced artificial surfaces. Some of the Europeans had. Um, so we're going into Toronto to play on an artificial turf, which was dry, which they play their American football gridiron on. Um, so played there for the first time. Pakistan were also at the camp, and so was India, um, and beat Pakistan for the first time in a practice game. And so we think, hmm, what's going on here, you know? Yep. And drew with India the next day. Um, so we're going into and think, oh, there's a bit of belief here. Uh, yeah. We did play um, Australia in a, a practice game and they beat us in the, at the village. And so it was something like five something. And um, so we thought, oh, okay, got our feet back on the ground, I think. Yeah. Um, played Germany in the first game of the Olympics and drew with them and they were the previous Olympic champions from Munich. That's right. Um, and so, you know, suddenly had the belief, um, all those all those years beforehand in terms of um, everything coming together from provincial level to um, that rivalry uh, with Auckland Canterbury and then just some of the international matches we'd played, you know, we're starting to mould into quite a useful team. We yeah. probably didn't realise how good we were going to be. Yeah. And then there's the legend story of um, you ha actually had a broken thumb and played in the final uh yeah, so, a broken thumb. so we played and missed the stroke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we play um Germany and um uh in the first game as I mentioned and uh uh the game came one all because uh you know, they'd scored first, but in that game in the first half I'd uh trapped a ball on my thumb on my right hand, um and it suddenly was sort of pointing you know, almost uh, sort of perpendicular, but not quite. Um, and uh, the doctor came on and just uh, put some bandage on and says, oh, it's okay, it's only bruised and it'll be okay. And so, okay. So carry on. Uh, we get a stroke in the second half and I put it in. Yeah. Makes it one all. Um, and then I come off and then they tell me it's broken. Okay. You know, so they said, look, um, we'll put uh, sort of an aluminium sort of brace on it and we'll tape it up and we'll see how you go. Um, we were playing Belgium, I think it was the next day. Um, no, it was Spain, actually. Um, and 
uh, came on and then uh, didn't start in the game and came on the second half. But, you know, at one stage they thought I wouldn't be able to play, so I was devastated about that. Um, so I just tried to give it the best I could in terms of playing and um, they could see I probably had a cheap feet um, waiting on the sideline, you know, thinking, oh, maybe if I could get 10 minutes or whatever. Um, anyway, we're one nil down and I come on and I was only on for about two or three minutes and we get a stroke and I'm the stroke taker. <laughs> yeah. So I think, oh, this is pretty good. Yeah. So I take it, we got it in. Yeah. And um, so that's how it started. So, and then the thumb has just become, yeah. you know, it's, you know, it's, it's something I now tell all the kids at my school as well, you know, not, not necessarily, <laughs> yes. but you know, um, if they say, oh, look, I've got a sore thumb thumb or sort of thing. <laughs> yeah. oh well you know you can play on with it I say yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, yeah. no that was that was amazing and um, clearly uh, we were one hockey was one of a few gold medals that was won at that Olympic Games and yes. you came back to New Zealand and, and now um, you were sort of recognisable especially around Auckland um, I remember Parrish and I used to drop us off um, my uncles and, and yourself to cricket at Cornwall Cricket Club and then the boys in my our team would would be waiting for about 10, 30, 11 o'clock on a Saturday morning because they know that you you and Mohan would sometimes run through the park uh, with your shirts off and you'd be training for the next season. And the boys would say, oh, well, that's Ramesh Patel, you know, and Parrish and I used to feel pretty proud about that. And um, I remember one day, and you probably don't know this story, but um, Parrish and I got a few little white pieces of paper together and we got you to sign them and we sold them for 10 <laughs> cents uh, to the boys in the team. So... You know, in those days with ten cents, you could go to the yeah, to the dairy yeah. and buy you know a bag of lollies. So we we did that. Uh, so thank you uh, for that. <laughs> but that was a lot of fun, and I think um, you probably um, didn't realise the extent of you know um, hockey had now lifted its profile, and and you guys had a small profile in the community. Yeah, absolutely. So you know, winning the gold medal in those Olympics, and we happened to win it the day before John Walker won it. Um, so, and John Walker was one of the first who came up and congratulated us, but also said, uh, wondered, you know, is that what it looks like, you know, okay. he said to himself, and of course he was under a lot of, a lot of pressure to try and win gold as well, which of course he did. Um, yeah, so, I mean, there's no doubt that the gold medal meant a lot, you know, not only to us, but to a lot of people, um, probably family in particular, um, and as you mentioned, you know, just, uh, the people, uh, the Indian community probably as well, yeah, and they would have been uh, very proud of that. So, yeah, it means a lot, and it probably shaped uh, my career from there on in yes. um, as well. Um, but, the, you know, the sort of uh, lift it gives you, um, the confidence it gives you, um, you know, probably was, you know, it has it had a strong bearing. You just don't realise how... Um, something like that can affect your life, and um, and but also uh, make so many people, you know, so happy and proud. Oh, absolutely. Um, so just with that social issues at the time, um, you know, as you sort of had just made the New Zealand team, gone to Olympic Games, become a gold medalist. Um, what can you remember about um, sort of the Indian side of your life during that time? Yeah, well, a huge influence. Um, you know, there's uh, you know, part of, even though um, I first started playing probably when I was at Tony Hunger High, that we were playing back in our backyards. And part of that was only because, you know, as, as you, know, you know, the Indians are probably stronger in cricket. And, and certainly in the villages we came from, they were stronger in cricket and hockey wasn't played that much in our villages. But it's, of course, when they had migrated here and, and trying to work themselves into the community, they thought, you know, sports teams and, yes, hockey, you know, India's always won these gold medals, so why not start? And yeah. that's how they started, um, playing hockey here. And um, uh, it was from, from that influence and then uh, watching the Indian sports teams. I used to right. go along and I used to go to Indian sports practices as a kid as well with, you know, because they used to do it at uh, the um, showgrounds. They yes. used to train out there indoors. And um, Sid Talkington, I think, was a coach at that time. And I used to go along and watch my brothers and them practice. Yep. Um, and so being a huge influence. And then, of course, um, while they were playing for Auckland Indian Sports Club, you had 
visiting Indian teams, the Indian Wanderers would come along, and I remember going to Hobson Park and watching one game, wow. um, and which was a huge influence. And so um, the Indian side of it, you know, was huge, not only here in New Zealand, but the fact that they've won all these gold medals, you know, they yeah. were sort of legends. And so that's, you know, there's no there's no doubt that uh, that was huge. And uh, hockey in particular was huge in New Zealand, um, yeah. you know, for Indians at that stage, more so than cricket. Of course, yeah. it's now turned around. Yes. <laughs> but, yeah. Uh, yeah. It was, uh, hockey was a big thing. So in terms of a... Uh, like I feel that you were a pathbreaker for us. Um, so when we were entering those sports, um, because of what you had done in your profile, it made our lives a little bit easier um, in terms of if our surname was Patel or our surname was, in my case, Daji, it, it made a really big, big difference. So people sort of went, oh, uh, you know, are you, do you know these guys or are you related to these people? Um, and it seemed to make a difference and, and broke a barrier. And I'm sure it happened in other codes as well, you know, in rugby league or in rugby union. So Brian did it, uh, Williams did it in rugby, and then there's Fred Arcoy in rugby league. So uh, we need to thank you um, for doing that. But did you realise at the time that you were sort of breaking down these barriers uh, for the next generation? No, no idea at yeah. all. You know, you just uh, you go out and play. And um, as I say, I had some... Um, good uh, managers along the way that probably kept your feet on the ground. They sort of looked after you um, and just made sure you were along the, the right path. Um, I don't think you realise that till later on. It's not something, you know, you think about. Um, at the time, you know, I'm a kid who's playing hockey, um, you know, yeah. just equal opportunities for all. Um, you didn't even think about, you know, your colour of your skin. Yeah. Um, it was... It was just the way it happened. Um, but then, of course, uh, the influence it did have is, you know, people always thought, oh, you know, you're good at these skills because you're Indian, you know, <laughs> which it made you, because you reflect and say, oh, of course, you know, because India used to win all these medals and things. And um, um, so in some ways it was quite good that yeah. because um, India was recognised as a strong hockey nation. So, you know, all the Europeans, you know, they... They realised, oh, if you've got an Indian in your team, you must must be a reasonably good team, or so be some quite good players. So, yeah. from that point of view, you know they knew that Indians could play hockey, and because yeah. it was the agility, but um, you know, and the speed that you know um, probably uh, at that time Indians playing probably had more than the Europeans did. Okay, yeah. And um, sh shortly after '76, you married Pani, um, your wife, uh, for it's a long time now. <laughs> yeah. So um, the, at that stage too, there was, uh, in the community, some people were starting to uh, have interracial marriages and you obviously had an Indian one. Clearly it wasn't a conscious decision uh, by you, but um, how, did you, how did you sort of, I know for some, there would have been some grandparents going, well, you know, look at Ramish, he's, a, he's an icon, he's marrying an Indian. I'm sure that would have been in some households that sort of conversation. Did you, did you feel any of that um, I, I think, yeah, I think you always um, feel that, you know, obviously culturally, you know, you're brought up that, you know, uh, you marry within your own race. Right. Um, that was certainly very strong when we were growing up. Um, having said that, my brother Mahendra, of yes. course, married uh, Julia, and um, and that wasn't, um, uh, didn't go down that well with my okay. parents initially. Um, and it's not till they probably had their children that my parents sort of change their views um, and uh, and my um, my sister was the same okay. um, so she'd married um, a European and um, but by by that stage you know it was it was it was sort of okay uh, with the parents but not really you know it was okay. still a, a little bit of feeling um, but uh, yeah, there's no doubt that it would have been there and you would have felt it. I think um, uh, I, w I would have probably felt it as well, but right. uh, I'm not sure which way I would have gone. It just yeah. happened that I married, saw Pani first, and, yeah. and that happened to be at an Indian social, sports club social or something, okay. and that's how we met, and um, so it starts like that. And yeah. having said that, you know, all my children are married Europeans. Yes. You know, um, and so... You know, but 
you know, as we all know, and it's it's just one of those things, a generational thing. Um, my view on this is, you know, I just want my kids to be happy. Yeah. And I think that was the prevailing attitude of the grandparents in the end. Um, I know with your mum and my grandmother being best mates and my grandfather saying once to me, he said, um, well, we, we brought you here to this country, which is uh, a non-Indian country. We educated you here. Um, and now we can't really be telling our um, children who they can and can't fall in love with. So quite a profound statement, you know, from a 96-year-old guy yeah, yeah. telling you um, that, that sort of thing. So I think they were, in fact, even more accepting uh, that generation than the, the one underneath them. Yes. So quite quite an interesting um, dilemma that was faced by a lot of people. Yeah. I think if you, you asked, you know, your parents, grandparents, you know, um, because I'll say one thing, and part of it, there's no doubt that it's how it's perceived by the rest of the Indian community. Yes. But if you took them aside and uh, told them, you know, what's best, you know, what's this perception of what yeah. the other people would say or what's best for your own children, yeah. you know, they they would go down, you know, love your children first. Yeah. Absolutely. So teaching uh, then came on the scene around um, 76 or so. Um, do you want to tell me a little bit, because that's a really great um, story about uh, how in those days we ne- we had to get um, do a little bit of country service, all of that thing. Tell, tell me a little bit about the teaching part of your life. Yeah, so it all started again. It was all revolved around sport, really. Um, so you're at university and um, fully involved in my sport, um, and then Mohan, my friend, um, was going to apply for teachers' college, and he said you can get these sort of scholarships. You know, at Varsity, when they pay you some money, and um, you know, it might have been something like forty dollars a week or something, and you get bonded to teaching. All it means is you go to training college, you go to teach, and uh, for the number of years you have that scholarship, you've got to teach for that number of years before, okay. otherwise you. I'm not sure what happens. You give the money back. I'm not sure how they would have done that. But anyway, so you sort of bonded for a couple of years. So I thought, oh, this is a good lark. I, I, <laughs> I could get onto this and get some money and uh, get my food at Varsity and things like that yeah. and still play my sport. Sure, I can teach for a bit. Yeah. That's how I got into it, really. Yes. Um, and um, But then once you're into teaching, you know, I just fell in love with teaching. I yeah. love Loved just being around um, people and, um, yeah, so uh, did a, did my stint at Waitra. Okay. Um, and uh, uh, and part of that was because uh, it was my year, uh, was the 76th year and I couldn't do it in the normal places and okay. because I was away overseas, um, you know, winning a gold medal. So there's no way I could do a section for training college, but they put one on for me at the end of the year. Okay. Um, and so I went out there and that was my teaching. But at training college was pretty much sign in uh, if I could dart out and do some hockey training and then, yeah. you know, show my face a little bit. But teaching college was pretty much, uh, I have to be, I suppose. And But where I could get out of it, I would just go. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so White your High School, was it? Yeah. So right in the middle of softball and uh, rugby league country and how yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But you know, I suppose you get accepted because at that stage you'd won a gold medal, so you get, yeah. you know, <laughs> you're always going to get accepted. So yeah. every sort of school I went to um, after that, you know, they always asked me to speak at the assembly. Well, I'm not used to speaking at that stage, you know, uh, but you soon learn, yeah. and um, and so you know. I remember reciting the same sort of stories each time about the Olympics from one school to the next school, you know. So it uh, you get used to it. Yeah. Yeah. And you landed on your feet at Auckland Grammar School um, under a, obviously a, a great Kiwi, Sir John Graham, yeah. principal of the school. Um, what was what was that like working under a legend? Yeah. Like so um, well, my first uh, three years uh, teaching was at Pukekohe High School, um, which was. You know, fantastic experience, yeah, because they have a strong um, Indian community out there as well. And so yes. getting involved with that team, you know, was uh, was probably the stepping stone. So that's where I learned to love teaching. Um, then went to Auckland Grammar for nine years and under um, Sir John Graham, yeah, real legend, um, really respected him. A tough man, strong opinions, um, Not didn't always believe in totally what he said. 
but you know he was so black and white you knew exactly where you stood um but yeah had a long friendship with him um yeah respected him a hell of a lot yeah oh look i um we were both lucky to to come underneath him at some point i know he's uh had such an influence and i think the biggest thing was out of his the people that he had uh, employed 25 people became secondary school principals mm. uh, over the, uh, you know over their life so that was pretty amazing so now um you are in teaching and then a ceo job sort of evolves at hockey new zealand and you end up doing that for a you know over 20 20 years um tell me about the sort of shift from teaching to now administering a sport and being a chief executive yeah so um you know it was all a little bit by chance when i got tapped on the shoulder to apply for this position um it was a big move at that time um i remember going to john graham and saying look you know, I've been, you know, I've been asked to sort of apply for this position, and it was at the end of the year, so they couldn't really even do a farewell for me because uh, John Graham said, "Look, go, go for it." I said, but he said, "I'll hold the position open here at Grammar for two years," okay. um, which was very good of him because you know you're going into a new venture, you know, young family, you're thinking, mm, you know, "Is this the right thing to do?" Yeah. Um, the federation, the hockey federation, had just been formed. Um, uh, but it was good at John Graham, so I had that sort of security. Uh, but he did say to me as I was departing, he says, I don't think you'll be back. And, um, yeah, so 20 years later, you know, I um, finished with uh, New Zealand hockey and uh, there was there was probably uh, my uh, most fantastic job and just, just loved um, every minute of it. A lot of stress and pressure with it, but look, always enjoyed getting up, wanting to go to work. Um, but it's a job, as you all know now, with Auckland Hockey as well, um, that um, you know, uh, sports administration never sleeps. You know, yes. it's it's on your mind the whole time. You're getting calls, you know, in weekends. You know, your whole life has to, you know, your family life is not in balance anymore, um, which is uh, a little bit unfortunate, but. I was fortunate in the fact that uh, Pani, my wife, would travel with me quite a lot, um, you know, around New Zealand or even overseas where we could, and so that sort of helped balance it out a bit. Um, I think of my grandkids now and uh, appreciate the time you can spend with them because certainly uh, with my kids growing up, while I, I do the normal stuff, I wish I could have spent more time with them. Yes. So the biggest learnings, are obviously there's a, a fast track to leadership um, of of people and, and doing that, and you'd had some leadership experience at sport. But what were the biggest sort of learnings you had as a as a, a leader um, in in the community now? Yeah, so you know, most of it you sort of I, I went in there um, quite inexperienced. Um, you know, having taught that was one thing, but just um, leading an organisation was different. I think what ha- happened at that time, and it was it's a different time to what it is now is you're developing. We started with two people running okay. New Zealand hockey. Um, and then, um, you know, we'd slowly grow and grow and grow. And, um, you know, people would ask, you know, what do you do is with marketing? Well, you, you had a marketing hat on, you had a coaching hat on, you had an administration hat on. So you're learning along the way. Luckily, at that time, the Hillary Commission um, was, um, uh, you know, helping uh, young CEOs, you know, yes. develop. Um, so that all helped, um, and we had a group of CEOs in Auckland where the sports groups always met once every two weeks or so, um, and just to share stories, yeah. um, and that's how you were learning. Um, the other thing was that, you know, certainly in terms of the way I was leading was more about, um, you know, treating the people the same way as that you'd like to be treated. Um, you know, everyone was equal. Um, the thing that frustrated me the most was how people would um, ring up the office and talk to some of my staff uh, in a certain way, but talk to me slightly different. And I could never accept that. You know, I wanted them all to be treated exactly the same. You know, no one should be putting anyone down or, you know, um, but they should treat, you know, but they would treat my staff differently to the way they would speak to me. And I always found that frustrating. So I always had that in the back of my, my mind when I'm dealing with other people as well. In the end, we have a great 
um, hockey community. So I learned as much off the regional associations as I did, you know, yes. um, from the top. So as long as it's collaborative and you're, you know, trying to work um, together, um, you're not going to please everyone. Um, that's just the way it is. Um, but you would hope that, uh, you know, you can still have a beer with them, even though we disagree on certain things. So um, it was a pretty much uh, learn as you went along yes. type things. Um, you know, uh, we're fortunate nowadays that you know, um, back then when we started with two people, to, you know, what we have now in these 14 organisations um, is, is quite different. Yeah. yeah. So um, you've seen a lot in, the, in your semi-retirement um, teaching at St. Kenyon College um, with the generation now that we teach, uh, whether that's the or coach, the, the millennials or, you know, the generation Zs. Um, what, what do you think uh, about that generation of kids? Uh, because I know sometimes they get a poor rap um, by people in society, but I think, um, you know, they don't seem to be that much different from... Uh, us, except they're growing up in a, in a very different time. Yeah. So, um, 11 years ago when I started at St. Kent's, as I mentioned previously, um, this was going to be a part-time job, and it is in a sense. Um, you know, I work eight months of the year and have four months off. Um, the, uh, and the reason, and I set myself three years, as I mentioned before, and I'm there now 11 years, and that's part of the reason why I'm there is because of the kids at the school. The, the young people, uh, you know, are, are tremendous in terms of, um, you know, their commitment to sport. Um, you know, people talk about young kids not being respectful. Well, you know, they're very respectful. Yes. Um, and, and it's part of the reason that I'm stayed at St. Kent's, um, and it wouldn't have mattered with St. Kent's or any other school, to be honest, but um, the, the young people were just great. And, and... Um, sure, I'm only at, with using the hockey uh, players. I'm around hockey players, but when I, even when I walk around the school and see some of the other sports and the other sports people in there, you know, they're all they're all decent young people. Um, what I love about them is they keep you alert. They keep you younger than what you are. You know, yeah. they give you fresh ideas, and you know, and I think well, I'm learning just as much as well. But um, yeah, uh, the, the the young people of today are just great. And when I'd left teaching, you know, that's 30, 40 years ago, um, uh, that at the time it was my best job. I went to hockey in New Zealand, that was my best job. <laughs> and now I'm at St. Kent's, I think, this is the best job. Yeah. You know, so all of them have been just uh, tremendous experiences for me. Yeah. Mm. And... Um I'm sure you, there's a sense of pride for you now when you look at, at New Zealand society, you're seeing um, Indian people, um, all different types of Indian people in the country, uh, more of us, but also the success uh, people are having in various fields. So, you know, whether that's arts, music, filmmaking, com you know, comedians, we have all sorts of other fields. Um, what, what's your take on, on that? Yeah, look, it's uh, I, I just get amazed with uh, the amount of talent. You know, watch the cricketers. You know, and lots of Indians coming through. I mean, even the hockey that's been established for some time, and the number of hockey players that come through. But uh, as you mentioned, you know, even in the arts and uh, everywhere you look, um, I think it's it's wonderful, and it's, it's something you get a sort of sense of pride. You know, when there's an Indian um, person doing well. Um, equally, you get disappointed when someone's on crime on the front <laughs> page, but it's going to happen. Yeah. Um, uh, but, yeah, look, uh, there's, there's no doubt there's a sense of pride. And, and, you know, I'm sure, as I mentioned before, as you're growing up as a young boy, um, you know, I didn't even notice the difference in colour. You know, you get a little bit older and then you suddenly do and all those sort of things. Um, but, you know, that's how you'd want it. You know, for my grandkids, that's how I'd want it. You know, just for them not to even know colours, and it just it wouldn't matter at all. And and then, of course, as you get older, it's sort of respecting the cultures, and um, uh, uh, it's just you know respect for each other. It's uh, all those things is what you would want. Um, so I think uh, the Indians here in uh, New Zealand do amazingly well. I ref I look back and I say, well. You know, in England, they started a lot earlier with the migration of Indians, and yes. there's a lot more Indians. 
And now you look on them and some of them, you know, the top people, yeah. you know, advising the government and, you know, all those things. So that's where, you know, we will get to yeah. in New Zealand. We're just a little bit behind in terms of quite there, but, yeah. you know. Who knows? And we've had a governor general <laughs> yeah. you know, as an Indian. So, Who knows? Yeah. Maybe prime minister next. So yeah, that's a real, um, probably a really good uh, piece to end on uh, today, Ramish. And so thank you uh, from the bottom of my heart for sharing your journey. Uh, I know you've been an inspiration to me personally, but there's a whole generation uh, or generations of us, and you know we would hope that. Um, they, some of some of them tune in and, and listen to your story, um, and I know they're going to be inspired. So thank you very much uh, for all you contributed. Welcome. Yeah. yeah. Cheers.